Hello and welcome to Chapter 28, Face and Neck Emergencies of the Emergency Care and Transportation of the Sick and Injured, 12th edition. After you complete this chapter and the related coursework, you will understand how to manage trauma-related issues with face and neck. You will also learn to recognize life threats associated with these emergencies and injuries and the correlation with the head and spinal trauma. The curriculum includes detailed anatomy and physiology of the head, neck, and eye, and discusses injuries including trauma to the mouth, penetrating neck trauma, laryngeotracheal injuries, and facial fractures. The chapter also includes information on dental injuries and blast injuries to the eye, management of common eye injuries such as foreign objects, puncture wounds, lacerated eyelids, burns, impaled objects, and complications from blunt trauma are included. Okay, so let's get started. The face and neck are particularly vulnerable to injury because of their relatively unprotected position on the body. Soft tissue injuries and fractures are common and vary in severity. Some injuries are life-threatening, such as uh, penetrating trauma to the neck may cause severe bleeding, and an open injury may allow an air embolism to enter the circulatory system. So let's talk about the anatomy and physiology of this area. The head is divided into the following. First is the cranium, and it's also referred to as the skull. It contains the brain. The posterior portion of the cranium is called the occiput. On each side of the cranium, the lateral portions are called the temples or temporal regions. The forehead is called the frontal region. Anterior to the ear, in the temporal region, you can feel the pulse of the superficial temporal artery. The six major bones of the face include, first you have the nasal bone, then you have two zagmus, two maxillae, and the mandible. The bony orbit protects the eye from injury. Composed of lower edge of the frontal bone and the zagma, the maxilla, and the nasal bones. Only the proximal third of the nose is formed by bone. The exposed portion of the ear is composed entirely of cartilage covered by skin. The external visible part is called the pina. The tragus is a small, rounded, fleshy bulge immediately anterior to the ear canal. The superficial temporal artery can be palpated just anterior to the tragus. About one inch posterior to the external opening of the ear is the mastoid process. The mandible forms the jaw and chin. Okay, so let's move down from the head into the neck. And the neck contains many important structures. Supported by the cervical spine, the first seven vertebrae in the cervical spine uh, is C1 through C7. The spinal cord exits from the forum magnum and lies within the spinal canal formed by vertebrae. The upper part of the esophagus and trachea lie in the midline of the neck. The carotid arteries are found on either side of the trachea along with the jugular veins and several nerves. The larynx, which is the Adam's apple, is located in the center of the anterior of the neck. The other portion of the larynx is the cricoid cartilage, and it's a form ridge of cartilage below the thyroid cartilage. The cricoid thyroid membrane lies between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. The trachea is below the larynx. The trachea connects the oral pharynx and the larynx with the main passages to the lungs. On either side of the lower larynx and the upper trachea lies the thyroid gland. Sternomastoid muscles originate from the mastoid process of the cranium and insert into the medial border of each collarbone and the sternum at the base of the neck. This allows for movement of the head. The eye, and that's a globe shape approximately one inch in diameter, is located within a bony socket in the skull called the orbit. 
It's composed of adjacent bones of the face and skull. In adults, the orbit protects over 80% of the eyeball. Between and below the orbits are the nasal bones and sinuses. The figure on this slide illustrates the major components of the eye. The eyeball, or globe, keeps its shape as a result of pressure from the fluid contained within the two chambers. Its clear jelly-like fluid near the back of the eye is called the vitreous humor. In the front of the lens, the clear fluid is called the aqueous humor. The conjunctiva is a membrane that covers the eye. The lacrimal glands, often are called tear glands, produce fluid to keep the eyes moist. The tear drains in the inner side of the eye through two lacrimal ducts into the nasal cavity. The sclera is white fibrous tissues that helps maintain the global shape and protects the more delicate inner structures. On the front of the eye, the sclera is replaced by clear transparent membrane called the cornea. This allows light to enter the eye. The iris is a circular muscle behind the cornea. The pupil is the opening in the center of the iris. It allows light to move to the back of the eye. Um, a condition in which a person is born with two different size pupils is called anascocora. Anascocora. The lens behind the iris, um, the lens focuses images on the retina at the back of the globe. The retina contains nerve endings, which respond to light by transmitting nerve impulses through the optic nerve to the brain. The retina is nourished by a layer of blood vessels between it and, and the back of the globe. Retinal detachment is when the retina detaches from the underlying um, choroid and can cause blindness. Injuries to the face and neck. So let's talk about these now. Injuries about the face and neck can often lead to partial or complete obstruction of the upper airway. Several factors may contribute to the obstruction. You could have blood clots in the upper airway from heavy facial bleeding or direct injuries to the nose and mouth and larynx and the trachea are often the source of significant bleeding or respiratory compromise. Injuries may cause teeth or dentures to become dislodged into the throat. Swelling that accompanies direct or indirect injury to those soft tissues can also contribute to an airway obstruction. The airway may also be affected when the patient's head is turned to the side. Possible injuries to the brain and the cervical spine may interfere with normal respirations. So soft tissue injuries. The face and neck are extremely vascular. Swelling in the area may be more severe. Skin and tissues in these areas have a rich blood supply and a blunt injury can cause a hematoma. And then there's dental injuries, okay? So mandible injuries are common because of its prominence, second only to nasal fractures in frequency. Most of these fractures are the result of vehicle collisions or assaults. Signs of mandible fractures include misaligned teeth, numbness to the chin, or the inability to open the mouth. Maxillary fractures are usually found after blunt force, high energy impacts. The sign of a maxillary fracture includes facial swelling, instability of facial bones, and misalignment of the teeth. Fractured and evolved teeth are common following facial trauma. Teeth fragments can become an airway obstruction and should be removed immediately. Okay, so now we're going to start talking about the patient assessment of the face and neck injuries. And just like every patient assessment, scene safety is highest priority. Then we're going to assess for any potential violence or environmental hazards. Standard precautions require eye protection and face masks because of the potential for projectile blood. Now determine the number of patients and consider the need for additional resources. So the mechanism of injury is going to be very important. Um, you want to assess the scene looking for indicators of that mechanism of injury. 
common MOIs for face and neck injuries include motor vehicle collisions, sports, falls, penetrating trauma, blunt trauma. Next, let's talk about the primary assessment. And this, let, you want to focus on identifying and managing life-threatening concerns. Threats to XABCs must be treated immediately. When there is life-threatening external hemorrhage, it should be addressed before the airway and breathing. Okay? You want to form that general impression, so look for important indicators of the seriousness of the patient condition. Injuries to the face and throat may be very obvious, but may also be hidden by collars or hats. Control blood loss with direct pressure. Consider the need for spinal immobilization and check the responsiveness using your AVPU scale. Airway and breathing. So ensure clear and patent airway. If the patient is unresponsive or has significantly altered level of consciousness, consider a properly sized oral pharyngeal. Quickly assess for adequacy of bleeding. Splinting or otherwise restricting the chest while motion is contraindicated. You do not want to attempt this. Now is the C. So assess the pulse and quality and significant bleeding is an immediate life threat, of course. And then the D, the transport decision. So consider quickly transporting patients with an airway or breathing problem or with a significant bleeding. Stabilization and maintenance of the airway and breathing, as well as control of bleeding, may be very difficult in patients with face and neck injuries. Consider advanced life support um, backup if the transport is too long. Patient with internal bleeding must be transported quickly for treatment by a physician. Signs of hypoperfusion imply the need for rapid transport. The patient who has a significant mechanism of injury but whose condition appears stable should also be transported promptly. Remember that any significant blow to the face or throat should increase your suspicion of spinal or brain injury, even if the patient has no signs of hyperperfusion or hypoperfusion or other life-threatening injuries, there is a possibility of eye injuries. History taking. So investigate the chief complaint. Obtain a medical history. Be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms. Be aware of the pertinent negatives, such as no pain or any loss of sensation. Next, get that sample history. An attempt to gather from friends or family if the patient's unresponsive. If unresponsive patient, you will only be able to notice signs of injuries. And then is your secondary assessment. So if multiple symptoms are likely to be affected, start with the assessment of the entire body looking for that DCAP BTLS. Do not delay transport to complete a thorough physical exam. In a responsive patient who has an isolated injury with limited mechanism of injury, consider focusing your physical examination. Ensure that control of bleeding is maintained and note the location of that injury. Inspect the wound for any foreign matter and stabilize the objects. During the physical exam, use both your eyes and your hands. If your patient is responsive, you should explain exactly what you're going to do and what you're looking for. And assess at all underlying systems. When evaluating the eyes, start with the outer aspects and work towards the pupils. Visual acuity is considered the vital sign of the eye. When it comes to vital signs, you want to assess and obtain those baselines so that you can observe for any changes during treatment. You must be concerned with visible bleeding and unseen bleeding inside the body cavity. With facial and throat fractures, baseline information about respirations and pulse are very important and use monitoring devices. And your reassessment. You want to repeat that primary, reassess vital signs in the chief complaint, and continually reassess the adequacy of airway, breathing, and circulation. Recheck patient interventions. This is particularly important in patients with facial or neck injuries because the ease in which the injuries can affect the associated symptom systems. The patient's condition should be reassessed at least every five minutes. As for interventions, 
you must provide complete spinal immobilization to any patient with suspected spinal injuries. You want to maintain an open airway, be prepared to suction the patient, and consider an oral pharyngeal. Whenever you suspect significant bleeding, provide high flow oxygen and control any significant visual bleeding. If the patient has any signs of hypoperfusion, treat the patient aggress aggressively for shock and provide rapid transport. Do not delay transport of a seriously injured patient to complete non-life-saving treatments in the field. Documentation and communication. In your documentation, include a description of the mechanism of injury and the position in which you found the patient. Emergency medical care. So treat soft tissue injuries to the face and neck the same as soft tissue injuries elsewhere on the body. Assess the XABCs and life threats first. Follow standard precautions. In the absence of life-threatening bleeding, the first step is to open and clear the airway. Avoid moving the neck in the patients with suspected cervical injury. Control bleeding by applying direct pressure with a sterile dry dressing. Use roller gauze, unwrap around the circumference of the head and to hold the pressure dressing in place. Do not apply excessive pressure if there is a possibility of underlying skull fracture. And when an injury ex uh, exposes the brain, eye, or other structures, cover the exposed parts with a moist sterile dressing. Apply ice locally to injuries that do not break the skin. And for soft tissue injuries around the mouth, check for bleeding inside the mouth. Physicians can sometimes graft a piece of an evolved skin back into the appropriate position. If you find portions of evolved skin, wrap them in sterile dressing, place them in a plastic bag, and keep them cool. If the skin is still attached in a loose flap, place the flap in the position that is uh, as close to normal as possible. All right, so then we're going to talk about emergency care for specific injuries. And first, we're going to talk about injuries to the eyes, okay? And so eye injuries are common, particularly in sports, and they can produce lifelong complications, including blindness. So proper emergency treatment will minimize pain and may prevent a permanent loss of vision. After an injury, pupil reaction or shape of the eye movement are often disturbed. Abnormal pupil reactions sometimes are a sign of a brain injury rather than an eye injury. Treatment starts with a thorough exam, so look for specific abnormalities or conditions that may suggest the nature of the injury. Foreign objects. The orbit protects the eye from penetration of large objects. Even a very small object may produce severe irritation. So irrigate with a sterile saline solution and it will fr and frequently flush away loose small particles. Gentle irrigation usually will not wash out foreign objects which are stuck to the cornea or underlying upper eyelid, under the upper eyelid. If you spot a foreign object on the surface of the eyelid, you may be able to remove it with a moist, cotton-tipped applicator. And so you could uh, follow the skill drill in 28-1. Okay, so foreign bodies, they may be impaled in the eye, and those must be removed by the physician. Your care involves stabilizing the object and preparing the patient for transport. And you could follow the steps in skill drill 28-2. When you see or suspect an impaled object in the eye, bandage both eyes with soft, soft bulky dressing to prevent further damage or injury. Burns of the eye. So first, of course, we need to stop the burn and prevent from further damage. When it comes to chemical burns, usually caused by acid or alkaline solutions, flush the eye with water or sterile solution to irrigation solution. Direct the amount of irrigation solution or water into the eye as gently as possible. The figure on this slide demonstrates four ways to irrigate the eye. You could use a nasal cannula, 
you could do the shower, a bottle, or a basin. Okay, so chemical burns. You may have to force the lids open, flush from the inner to the outside corner. If the burn was caused by a, an alkali or a strong acid, irrigate continuously for at least 20 minutes. After irrigation, apply clean, dry dressing and cover the eye and transport. When it comes to thermal burns, during a fire, the eyes will close to protect them from heat. However, eyelids are frequently burned and require specialized care. Cover both eyes with a sterile dressing, uh, moistened with sterile saline. Then you could have light burns. So infrared rays, uh, eclipse light, and laser beams can cause significant damage to the sensory cells of the eye. Retinal injuries caused by exposure to extreme bright light are generally not painful, but may result in permanent damage. Superficial burns of the eye can result in off from ultraviolet rays from an arc welding light, light from prolonged exposure to a sun lamp or reflected light from a bright snow covered area. It may be painful at first, but they may become painful within three or four hours later. So severe conjunctitis usually develops with red swelling and excessive tear production. Cover each eye with a sterile moist pad and an eye shield. Lacerations, and these require very careful repair to restore appearance and function. If there is a laceration of the globe itself, apply no pressure to the eye. Gently apply a moist sterile dressing to prevent drying and cover the injure with a protective metal shield cup or sterile dressing to prevent drying and apply a soft dressing to both eyes. On rare occasions, the eyeball may be dislodged from the socket. Do not attempt to reposition it. Cover the eye and stabilize it with moist sterile dressing. Cover both eyes to prevent further injury because of sympathetic movement. Have the patient lie supine to prevent loss of fluid from the eye. And then there's blunt trauma to the eye, okay? So you could have an orbit fracture or a blowout fracture. Bone fragments can entrap some of the muscles that control the eye movement, causing double vision. Protect the injured eye with a metal shield and cover the eye to minimize movement with a, um, on, another, on the other injured side. Okay, so eye injuries following a head injury. So there's signs and symptoms of a possible head injury. And these could be when one pupil is larger than the other, or the eyes are not moving together or pointing in different directions. Failure of the eyes to follow movement of your fingers is um, if it's if you instruct them to do that and they cannot do that. So bleeding under the conjunctiva, protrusion or bulging of an eye, management, what you want to do is keep the eyelids closed and cover the lids with moist gauze or hold them closed with clear tape. Then you could have blast injuries. And so signs and symptoms of blast injuries range from, range from severe pain and loss of vision to foreign objects within the globe. Management of injuries to the eye depends on the severity of the injury. And then there's contact lenses or artificial eyes. In general, do not attempt to remove them except for chemical um, burns. Um, to remove hard contact lenses, use a small cup, um, suction cup, and these are specially made for those contact lenses, okay? To remove soft ones, place one or two drops of saline in the eye. You could gently pinch the lens between your glove, thumb, and index finger, okay? Place the lens in a container with some sterile saline solution and advise the hospital if the patient is wearing contact lenses. Care for the, an artificial eye as you would for a normal one. In the figure on this slide, it'll show you how to remove hard contact lenses and soft contact lenses. Okay, next we're going to talk about injuries to the nose. And nosebleeds, which are um, epistasis, are a common problem. Okay, and one of the most common causes is digital trauma. It's characterized into anterior and posterior epistasis. 
and anterior nosebleed usually originally from the area of the septum and bleed fairly slowly. Posterior nosebleeds are usually more severe and often cause blood to drain into the back of the patient's throat. Blunt trauma to the nose may be associated with fractures and soft tissue injuries of the face, head injuries, and injuries to the cervical spine. So you want to assess the nose structures for injury. And this slide shows um, the two chambers which are divided by that septum. Patients with severe nasal injury may also have that cervical spine injury and cerebral spinal fluid, so CSF, may escape down through the nose following the fracture to the base of the skull. Control bleeding by applying sterile dressing. If the patient is bleeding heavily, it can be a result of significant trauma. So for a non-trauma patient who's bleeding from the nose, pace the patient, place the patient in the sitting position, leaning forward, and pinch the nostrils together. Now we're going to talk about injuries to the ear, okay? So these are divided into three parts, external, middle, and inner. And the figure on the slide shows the structures of the inner ear. Ears are often injured, but they do not usually bleed very much. So if local pressure does not control the bleeding, apply a roller dressing. In case of a severe um, ear avulsion, wrap the avulsed part in a moist sterile dressing and place it in a plastic bag labeled with the patient's name. A tampanic membrane rupture, sun changes in pressure create a blast wave can cause a rupture and patients will report severe pain, difficulty hearing or ringing in that affected ear. It may be caused by insertion of objects too far into the ear. So uh, children place foreign objects into that auditory canal. All foreign objects or bodies should not be removed um, by you. They need to be removed by a physician. So do not uh, try to manipulate the foreign body because you could push it back further into the ear. Clear fluid coming from the ear may indicate a skull fracture. Next, we're going to talk about facial fractures. And so in addition to external hemorrhage, there's a danger of blood clots lodging in that upper airway and causing obstruction. Plastic surgeons can repair the damage to the face and mouth if the injuries are treated within 7 to 10 days. So remove and save loose teeth or bone fragments from the mouth because it is often possible to replant them. Remove any loose dentures and dental bridges to protect against an airway obstruction. Another source of airway obstruction is swelling, and which can be extreme within the first 24 hours after injury. Then there's dental injuries. It can be traumatic to the patient. The injury may be traumatic and the patient's permanent teeth may be lost. Bleeding will occur within a tooth and when it's violently displaced from the socket. So apply direct pressure to stop the bleeding, perform suctioning if needed, and cracked or loose teeth are possible airway obstructions. So save and transport that tooth, um, handling it by the crown rather than the root, and place the tooth in a tooth storage solution, cold milk, or a sterile saline. Then injuries to the cheek. So if you're unable to control bleeding and it compromises the airway, consider removing the object. Provide direct pressure on both sides, inside and out, okay, of the cheek. The amount of bandaging should not be so overwhelming, though, that it occludes the mouth and makes it difficult to breathe. And then with injuries to the neck. The neck contains many structures, and it's very vulnerable to injury by blood trauma. Any crushing injury of the upper part of the neck is likely to involve the larynx or trachea, fractures of the upper airway, and laryngeal cartilage. So signs and symptoms include, include loss of voice, difficulty swallowing, severe and sometimes fatal airway obstruction, and leakage of air into soft tissues of the neck. This is called subcutaneous emphysema. Management of this, so maintain the airway and immediately transport. You want to consider advanced life support early and also consider spinal motion restriction. When it comes to penetrating trauma in that area, 
you can uh, it can cause profuse bleeding from lacerations of great vessels in the neck. Injuries to the carotid and jugular veins in the neck cause the body to bleed out. If a vein has been punctured, an air embolism may result. The air the esophagus and the spinal cord can be damaged by a penetrating injury. Direct pressure over the bleeding site will control most of the neck bleeding. Follow the steps in Skill Drill 28-3 and assess for signs of shock, immediate spinal motion restriction if indicated, and apply high flow oxygen. When it comes to laryngeal injuries, and this is blunt force trauma, it can cause the larynx to be injured. Um, it's usually an unrestrained driver who strikes the steering wheel or possibly maybe a snowmobile rider or an off-road off bike rider that strikes a clothesline or a fixed wire. The larynx can become crushed against the cervical spine, resulting in soft tissue injury, fractures, or separation of the fascia. These strangulation injuries can also be found in either intentional or unintentional hangings. Anytime there is suspected injury to the larynx, suspect possible cervical spine injury. Penetrating or impaled objects in the larynx should not be removed unless they interfere with CPR. Stabilize all impaled objects if they are not obstructing the airway. Significant injuries to the larynx pose an immediate risk of airway compromise. And of course, signs and symptoms of a larynx injury include respiratory distress, harsh, hoarseness, pain, difficulty swallowing, cyanosis, pale skin, sputum in the wound, um, subcutaneous emphysema, bruising on the neck, hematoma, and bleeding. So you want to provide oxygen and ventilate and then C-spine, but avoid the use of a rigid collar. Okay. So that includes chapter 28, the face and neck injuries lecture. Next, we're just gonna go through the review questions to see what we've learned, okay? So which of the following statements regarding the apple, Adam's apple is false? Which one? Is it inferior to the cricoid? Is it formed by the thyroid? Is it the uppermost part of the larynx? Or is it more prominent in men and women? All right, and so it is A. It is inferior to the cricoid cartilage that is incorrect, okay? But the eye is also called, do you guys remember? And that's the eyeball, D, so it's D. When a person is looking at an object up close, the pupil should, do you guys remember? So the pupil should allow the light to move to the back of the eye and it is going to constrict. When caring for a chemical burn to the eye, the EMT should right. So when we're when we're um, doing flushing the eye, we need to flush it away from the uninjured eye, and so that's what it was. It was to prevent contamination of the opposite eye. Okay. So number five, which of the following signs is least indicative? of a head injury or indicative of a head injury. And we know it is pupillary constriction to the bright light, because that's what it's supposed to do, right? Pupils are supposed to constrict. Okay, and what do we think is the purpose of this station tube? What is it supposed to do? And it's the middle air, and it is supposed to equalize pressure in the middle air when external pressure changes. When caring for a patient with facial trauma, the EMT should be most concerned with, well, I'm going to say airway compromise. That is big, big deal. No airway, no patient. The presence of subcutaneous emphysema following trauma to the face and throat is most suggested of, so crushing injuries of that uh, larynx, okay? So tracheal injuries. and that is because air is escaping just right underneath this, right under the skin, right? So subcutaneous emphysema is formed. Number nine, a 21 year old male has a large laceration to his neck. When you assess him, you know bright red blood is spurting. So we know that that is an arterial bleed from the left side of the neck. What should you do? 
with an arterial bleed. All right, so here we go. You're going to place your gloved hand over it first, and I'm sure you're going to put some type of dressing bandage on it. Which of the following mechanisms of injury would most likely cause a crushing injury to the larynx or trachea? All right, so GSW, car crash, patient whose head hits the windshield. And right away, you could see the attempted suicide by a hanging. Okay. Okay, so thank you for joining us today for Chapter 28, Face and Neck Injuries. And if you like this uh, lecture, go ahead and subscribe to the channel because we're going to complete the whole book. Thank you.